Tonight is a chance to focus on four personal snapshots of the way women interact with or inspired by or work on behalf of the countryside. I hope our experiences resonate with all of you and inspire you to cherish or reevaluate your own connections and seek new ones. And first, Gillian Burke. Last week, we saw her on BBC's Winter Watch in deepest, darkest, coldest Cairngorms, the UK's largest national park and one of and its wildest landscape, a marvellous place. She was in search of pine martins and red squirrels, golden eagles and crested tits. And it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce you to Gillian Burke, TV presenter, writer, narrator, with a passion for all creatures, great and small. Thank you. I've spent most of my working life um, really pushing to one side, like absolutely wanting to be blinkered and uh, determined that being a woman, being a black woman, a woman of color, makes absolutely no difference to my path, you know, my chosen path. Sometimes I can't quite see the path, but whatever it is, it hasn't made a difference. I'd like to think that um, to the way I've made decisions, the kind of opportunities I've had. I've simply chosen to follow my passions and try and do my job well. So when I started thinking about what, what does this mean to me, women in the countryside, it actually brought me, well, it brought back some really wonderful memories, actually. And it bumped me up against a few uncomfortable truths. And actually, none of these had anything to do with my working life. So between mom and dad, um, the seed was planted in terms of who I am today, the things I'm passionate about, the things I care about, and essentially that's the environment and the natural world. However, underpinning all of that was something even more important. And for me, that was the time and the space to be completely unsupervised, to roam and explore the outdoors, just to become really, really comfortable with the outdoors. Those little feet there <laughs> um, rarely saw shoes when I was that age. Um, I had to wear shoes at school. And of course, if we had to go into town, I'd wear shoes. But the second I got home, I'd kick them off and I was out. And um, I think I was actually quite well turned out for that photo. I don't think I ever looked quite as smart as that <laughs> on my normal life. But um, I really, really did. I got very comfortable with the outdoors. I would spend hours lying on my back, staring at the sky, watching clouds go by. I'd watch sunbirds flitting around, drinking nectar from the bottle, bottle brush tree. Um, so there were lovely, beautiful things. But there was also the dust, the heat, the thorns, of which there are many in Kenya, the biting insects. So what I think I learned to do at that age was to accept the natural world as being a beautiful place, a place where you can go to relax and contemplate, but also a place that can hurt you, a place that can be uncomfortable, um, a place that can anger and frustrate you. And to me, I mean, it sort of alludes to what Emma was saying, it's the mess as well as, you know, it's the rough and the, taking the rough with the smooth. That, to me, was the, the basis of my relationship with the natural world. And I really, really believe is, is kind of what should underpin all of our relationship with the natural world. Um, not much has changed <laughs> since those days. I still love, if I can, at any given opportunity, uh, being barefoot, being grounded, um, getting messy. And I love the elements. And I really believe that before we can start um, naming and classifying and measuring and surveying and campaigning and all the things that you know involve our, our minds, our sort of thinking, sort of cognitive cerebral cells. It, it's this. It's the physicality. It's the ab absolute. All the senses being involved and really, really making friends with the beautiful and the comfortable and the not so comfortable. Our next speaker, Edwina Erman the b &A's senior curator of Fashion from Nature, um, the exhibition which explored the complex relationship between fashion and nature over the past 400 years. The Clean Air Act, subsequent envir environmental legislation, cleaner technologies, and the dramatic decline of local industries have transformed the environment where I grew up. But sadly, what I saw as a child has become a, gro a global phenomenon and a massive global challenge. So my exhibition, Fashion from Nature, set out to tell this story. It posed two questions. How can we design a better, cleaner, more responsible fashion industry? 
and what can we learn from the past. So here you've got the entrance to the exhibition uh, with the um, title board, uh, which, for which we recreated lichen. Lichen grow all over the world in the most amazing uh, different forms and shapes and colours. And also several lichens are used as natural dyes. Um, and the suit is one of my favourites. It was designed by John Galliano, um, and uh, he, he chose the Linton Tweed because when he saw it, he imagined himself being a bird flying over a ploughed field and catching sight of the um, white fleece from sheep in the hedgerows. And I thought that was an absolutely magical interpretation of a fabric. Uh, and although it was a very expensive fabric for him at the beginning of his career, he was determined to have it. So the exhibition explored the complex, uneasy and unequal relationship between fashion and nature. The title was very deliberate. Fashion is quite literally fashioned or made from materials found in the natural world. Uh, from the raw materials used at the first stage of a garment's life cycle, to the energy required to deliver the clothes we buy to the high street and our homes. Starting, starting in 1600, the exhibition interwove two stories. It never lost sight of the inspiration and creativity, fashion and the other arts, find in nature's diversity, colour and textures, and our human fascination and interaction with the natural world. But if focus lay in the fashion industry's increasingly negative impact on the environment and, in, and ecosystems, as it grew in scale and complexity. And yet, it argued that sustainability should be a core principle of design. Its aim was to raise awareness and encourage debate, certainly not prompt feelings of guilt or to preach. It was solution focused and materials driven, and it brought together past, present, and future nature and fashion. Um, and at the VNA, we encourage people to leave um, comments about our exhibitions. So we get both uh, many negative comments about things, but luckily we also get some positive comments. And one thing that many people said about the exhibition was it was an eye-opener, uh, thought-provoking, uh, that people had no idea about the impact of the fashion industry on the environment. Uh, and I think one person described it as being unsettling. And when things unsettle you, they linger in the mind and potentially have the power to change behaviours. Um, our last speaker is Polly Neat. It gives me huge pleasure to introduce you. Um, Polly is a prominent commentator on violence against women, sexism and feminism. We were particularly pleased to work with Polly and colleagues at Shelter last year in shining a spotlight on the lack of affordable housing blighting many rural communities through our joint report, Viable Villages. And we look forward to developing further solutions together on building the homes that our country needs without ruining the countryside. When we stop and think of the division sown when we deny people the right to a safe home, the countryside and London have more in common than either has with our other towns and cities. Property in the English countryside is less affordable to those who've been there for two or more generations than anywhere other than London. Young people, old people, single parent families, people in low paid jobs are priced out of villages. And if Dick Whittington went off to seek his fortune now, he'd be far less likely to end up Lord Mayor of London, I can tell you. Impossible, because social mobility in both the countryside and London are frozen. In the countryside, communities are changing. Schools and pubs are increasingly at risk of closing. 52 rural schools and a similar number of post offices closed between 2012 and 2017. New homes are not being built in the main because people don't want them. And this is not to say at all that people in the countryside are NIMBYs. What people want is visually attractive homes that local people can afford. And that is not what's on offer. The shortage of social housing is worse in the English countryside than anywhere else, including London. When it comes to social injustice, London and the countryside have a surprising amount in common. My greatest fear for the city I love is it becomes a kind of playground for the rich. Like our capital city, our countryside, surely in a sense, belongs to us all. 
both capital and countryside are icons of our national identity. We must all care what both London and our precious rural places become. Even if we are rich enough to enter those playgrounds ourselves, surely we lose something when communities fragment and even disappear. And as a feminist, I'm acutely conscious that where divisions, hardship and exclusion exist, women will suffer the most. The only answer is a transformational investment in social housing. Not only for the 1.2 million people currently on the waiting list, you did invite a campaigner to speak, but for older people who will be renting for life and can't survive on six-month contracts, regular moves, no settled home, homes that can't possibly be adapted as they age. And younger people who will otherwise never put down roots in their local area and for whom social housing is actually the only route into home ownership by either allowing them space and time to save for a deposit or even to benefit from the right to buy. There isn't a right to buy because there isn't anything to buy. Social housing is the only way to end our housing crisis and it doesn't have to be ugly and it doesn't have to be on the green belt. It is needed as much in the countryside as in cities and towns. At Shelter, we brought together a commission including former Conservative and Labour ministers, social housing tenants, survivors of the Grenfell fire, think tanks and many others to form a vision for the future of social housing. You may have seen the media coverage of the launch of the report recently. I believe the huge traction that report gained was because we are at a critical moment in time right now where we need a way to unite our desperately divided country. The CPRE is on the case as well, and I'm proud that Shelter and CPRE work in partnership. <laughs> who was cycling two miles to visit his daughter. By treating the forest, which is a national park, as their own back garden, they hurt and intimidated someone who has lived there all his life. Bitter divisions cannot exist without harm. There's nothing that unites us more than our great national cultural landmarks and our green and pleasant land. When both are no longer part of the lives of so many, we're all the poorer for it.